This presentation is about how we might use graphics to more effectively support learning in the classroom and online. It's important to have a theoretical basis for the choices we make in education, so we'll start with some theory of graphic use in education. Next, an overview of the types of graphics used in learning will be beneficial, and finally, we'll look at an example of a graphics development process. This presentation uses several sources, but one resource you should consider if you want to learn more about graphics and learning is Creating Graphics for Learning and Performance by Linda Lohr. There is a long-standing and often repeated maxim of media and education, which equates increasing levels of learning with different educational experiences. This proverb that people remember 10% of what they read, 20% of what they see, etc., has recently been debunked as wholly fabricated in the 1960s and propelled forward through massive and circular citations ever since. Not to say that different learning media don't produce different and in many instances better learning results, but the overall picture of what media is how effective for a specific need is more complex than can be displayed in a simple chart. Media can improve learning, but just like any other aid to instruction, the purposeful and informed development of this media has more to do with success than a simple choice to include it. An unexamined belief that media will increase learning is an example of technocentric thinking. There are several theories of media in education and, most recently, theories of multimedia learning have endeavored to explain how media can best be used in learning and teaching. These theories are not mutually exclusive, and they do not attempt to provide holistic frameworks that explain all educational phenomena. In fact, some of these theories are refinements or developments of previous theories. Many of these are also relevant to learning in general, and to learning with other media. One point to keep in mind when considering theory in relation to your practice as an educator is that the value of these theories come from their ability to explain and predict what happens when you use graphics for learning. They are not a definitive physiology of the brain. They are metaphors that communicate the way psychologists and educators understand how the brain works. So when we talk about the intrinsic load and the extraneous load in cognitive load theory, or about the visual pathway and the oral pathway in dual coding theory, we aren't arguing that we can find an intrinsic load or visual pathway area of the brain complete with adjacent components that complete a specific theory. Instead, we're saying that these models help us to understand the current state of scholarship in making sense of the learning. Take care not to push these metaphors too far and try to stay informed on developments in the field. You should consult academic works like Linda Lohr's book or the readings listed for your course to get a thorough understanding of these theories, but here's a capsule description of each. Cognitive load theory argues that only so many elements can be simultaneously considered by a learner. This means that we should strive to limit extraneous elements and chunk learning into packets that suit the capabilities of the learners. Information processing theory describes the process of using short-term memory to transfer learning to long-term memory. It indicates that some strategies are useful for acquiring content in short-term memory, while other strategies are subsequently needed to transfer this to long-term memory. In dual coding theory, a distinction is made between visual and oral pathways by which information is received by the learner. Appealing to both pathways simultaneously and in concert is the best way to promote learning. Episodic buffer theory argues for the existence of a function of the brain that interfaces with the visual and oral information held in working memory, allowing the two to be integrated. By designing oral and visual media that are already integrated, transfer to long-term memory can be promoted. Meyer's cognitive theory of multimedia integrates several of the preceding theories and defines three cognitive processes that media should help learners achieve selection, organization, and integration. Media should help learners select information by making important information prominent. Help learners organize information by displaying it in a way that facilitates understanding of the underlying relationships. And help learners integrate information by placing information of different types 
in close physical and temporal proximity. Graphics can be categorized in five groups decorative, representative, organizational, interpretive, and transformative. Decorative graphics can be used to add appeal to content and motivate learners to engage with material. They may or may not be relevant to the topic and are not considered to increase learning. Care must be taken to ensure that decorative graphics do not interfere with learning by distracting attention from important content. Representative graphics convey information with a combination of words and shapes. They may be culturally specific, so take care that they're used appropriately. Organizational graphics convey structure, sequence, hierarchy, or spatial relationship. These include organized textual graphics like a table of contents. Interpretive graphics display ambiguous or abstract information or provide graphic examples of concepts. They may do this by means of metaphor or by taking advantage of the relationship between a concept and a physical property. Transformative graphics make content memorable and promote thinking about the content. These graphics work on long-term long memory by using visual analogy. Several processes for designing educational graphics have been proposed and in the next few slides we'll address some actions and tools for graphics in a model proposed by Linda Lohr in her book Creating Graphics for Learning and Performance. But first we'll take a look at a few of the other steps in this model. The first step requires that you consider what the graphic will be used to achieve. This is no different than the first step in planning any other unit of instruction. Teachers must consider the objective before proceeding, proceeding with designing the learning. When creating a graphic, you should be guided by principles that have been established through well-grounded research. In many readings and other materials, you will become familiar with the principles expounded by Richard Meyer, so I won't repeat those principles here. Finally, at the end of this process, after deploying a unit of learning, we have to evaluate it for effectiveness, efficiency, and appeal. Like the first step in this process, this applies to all units of education, not just graphics. So there are a number of actions that you can achieve when you're designing graphics. Contrast can establish differences between elements that highlight important information. Create more contrast than you perceive is needed to make information stand out. Your learners will approach your graphic with fresh eyes and they won't be trying to see what you've designed. Alignment allows you to establish groups and schema about how your information should be perceived. Choices in alignment can be used to chunk, differentiate, or even declare properties for your information. Repetition of graphic elements can be used to indicate specific recurring pieces of information. Repetition of color schemes can be used to reassure learners that their content is related. Proximity can be used to indicate what is related or what forms a group, as well as to indicate elements that are isolated. Type can be manipulated using the four actions that we just described, contrast, alignment, repetition, and proximity. It can also take advantage of the culturally derived meanings associated with specific fonts. Color can be important for detail or for establishing complex schemas. It can add warmth or aesthetic appeal to a graphic, but it can also be distracting. Shapes help learners see patterns, groups, or specific meaning in the content set before them. Shape can take advantage of or disrupt natural patterns of eye movement over a graphic. Depth is the use of visual cues to assert three-dimensional properties in an image. This can help convey or add visual interest. Space can have the effect of magnifying or directing attention to a graphic element, or it can convey a meaning in itself. 